on. So it's my pleasure to introduce Susan. Um, hi. Um, yeah, my name is Susan. I'm really happy to be here today. It's such an exciting event. Um, so yeah, just a bit about myself. Um, I have a background in statistics. Um, I did a PhD in statistics in the Netherlands. Um, and th yeah, there I focused on Bayesian hierarchical models um, with a specific focus in um, application in medical research. Um, so I was in medical research area for quite a while. Um, so, um, so from looking at um, a yellow fever in Botswana during my undergrad um, to HIV in South Africa during my master's and then got glaucoma um, in the Netherlands and the UK um, during my PhD and postdocs. Um, I then uh, moved into the charity sector where I worked as a data scientist um, for a cancer charity. Um, and now I'm working as a data scientist at um, Product Madness. Um, and I think one of the great things about being a data scientist is that you can work in so many different areas um, and you can use very similar um, modeling techniques or approaches to answer very different problems. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about A-B testing um, and specifically A-B testing within Product Madness. So just a bit about the company. Um, so Product Madness is a digital social slots gaming company. And what that means is that we have um, casino-based or casino-like slot machines, um, which are free to play in a digital form. So we were, um, started, we were founded in 2007 by two Stanford um, MBA graduates um, who had a real passion for gaming. In 2012, we were acquired by Aristocrat which are now known as Pixel United. And this is a really big um, land-based slots machine company. Um, they'll be huge in Vegas and all over the world. And what that means is that we can now use their land-based slot content and combine that with our digital platform. And that also means players can now, that would be going to sort of land-based slot machines can now do this on their phones. Um, so we have four apps. Um, so original is Heart of Vegas. Um, we then introduced Cashman Casino Slots. And we have Lightning Link and Far 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 Gold. And within all of these apps, um, we're continuously trying to improve user engagement or user um, experience um, for the players. And that's where A-B testing comes into it. So A-B testing is essentially a randomized controlled trial uh, where participants are randomly split into groups where each group is given a different version of the treatment. And this gives us a way to compare the performance of two or more treatments. So if we think about this as an example in a, a medical setting, uh, we might want to test out a new drug, in which case we would give one group a placebo and one group the new drug, and we can then compare the performance of the new drug compared to the placebo. Um, in terms of sort of an app, we might want to sort of change the color of a button. So we might show one um, group of players a blue button, one group an orange button, and then we can see sort of the preference of the players based on, on this. And this can then extend to sort of having features on and off, and different adjustments that we want to do within the feature. So everybody has these sort of grand ideas of how they want to improve the service. So they might be convinced that this blue button is going to be um, much preferred than this orange button. Um, but we actually want evidence to show this. And A-B testing allows us uh, a way that we can provide this evidence, uh, and then all of our decisions can actually be um, data-driven decisions. Um, there's a lot of advantages to A-B testing. Um, it eliminates the guesswork from the optimization. Um, it doesn't require any models, and it has very few assumptions. It's widely applicable, so we can use it on, on almost any example. And it uses real players. So we're actually testing this on uh, the players that play our game, and these are the players that we want to roll this out to. And because we use random allocation, um, we take into account the nuisance factors. And with sufficiently large sample sizes, we can iron out the differences between the groups. Um, so we can take into account differences that we don't anticipate before the test, or that we aren't even able to measure. There are also disadvantages or difficulties. Sorry, when running an A/B test. Um, so one thing is that we want to be we want to make sure that we're synchronized uh, across all teams involved when running this test. And by that I mean everybody from the product teams and the people that are coming up with ideas, um, and the people that are they are going to configure this. Um, the people that are going to analyze it, and those people that are going to make decisions. 
It can also take a long time before we get reliable results. So it's not like we can um, sort of come up with an idea, test it, and uh, roll it out the next day. We do need to wait um, quite a long time for these results, and especially if we want reliable results. Um, small treatment effects uh, may be quite tricky to detect, especially if there's a lot of background noise. And then some metrics might be highly volatile, or there might be small sample sizes. So even if we roll this out to the whole population, some metrics will have smaller sample sizes than others. So if you think of uh, average revenue per user versus average revenue per paying user, the latter is then going to obviously have a, a smaller sample size. Um, yeah, so we're not parametric or normal. And by that, I mean that our data is not normally distributed. Um, sample sizes can be too small for asymptotic tests to work. And this will almost certainly violate some of the assumptions of statistical testing. So although violating these assumptions doesn't mean that we can't use these parametric statistical tests, it does reduce the power. The other thing is to consider is that as data scientists, our role is to help make decisions. And with frequent statistics, we will get an answer. Generally, this will be binary. We will know if um, the blue button is better than the orange. Um, but business units often want to know the certainty of the results, and then hence the certainty of the decisions that we're making. Um, yeah, so a quick question. What do you see here? <laughs> Anyone? Yeah? Anything more? <laughs> yeah, so most people would say a black dog, um, in which case I would say you're a Bayesian, because if you were a frequentist, you would have no prior knowledge and you would say half a black dog. Um, so although this is sort of a simple example, the idea is that sort of in everyday decisions, we are generally making these decisions in a Bayesian way, um, which makes sense then to use it in our analysis as well. So the advantages of Bayesian statistics is that it allows us to use prior information with our data. We can provide inferences that are conditional on the data and exact uh, without reliance on asymptotic approximation, and we have interpretable answers. Um, so within Product Madness, um, we use Bayesian Bootstrap. Um, and how it's done is we draw weights from a uniform Dirichlet distribution with the same dimension as the number of um, data points. We then calculate the statistics using this draw for the test and control, and record it, take the difference, repeat n times, and draw the distribution of the differences. Um, so one other concept is um, the rope. So this is the region of practical equivalence. So this is the notion of proximity to the null value. So this specifies the range of parameter values that are equivalent to the null value for practical purposes. So these results might be significant, but they're potentially immaterial. So when we make a decision, we generally think of two things. Um, the first part is a summary of the certainty about the measurement. So for this, we use the highest density interval, or HDI. And this we use as a sort of summary of the range of most credible values of the measurement. And then we have the range of parameters that um, are actually good enough for practical purposes. So for this, we use the, the region of practical equivalence or rope. So this is just an example of the output we would get from the Bayesian bootstrap. Um, so in this example here, you can see on the x-axis, we have the metric uplift and percentage. And on the y-axis, we have the probability of this uplift. The blue area is in the rope, and in our case, we look from minus 1 to 1 percent. And the bottom bar there in black uh, represents the 90 percent um, HDI. So in red, then, we have the cumulative density function, and we can use this um, to analyze our results. So in this case, we would say that we're about 80 percent sure that the uplift is above 0 percent. Um, yeah, so just to give you a few more examples about uh, different results we might get and how we would interpret them. So in the first example, in A, this would uh, give you a result that's a positive uplift. So you can see that the 90% the HDI is above zero, doesn't cross zero, it's um, not within the rope. Um, so in this case, we would conclude that the, the treatment is, uh, shows a positive uplift compared to the control. 
In the next example, again, we see this um, positive uplift. The ATI is above zero. Um, in this case, though, it does cross within the rope. So it is positive, but it's potentially immaterial. In the third example, um, we see the opposite. We see a negative effect. So it's in the, the, the left side of zero. Um, it doesn't cross zero. However, the entire HDI is within that rope. Um, so in this case, we would say it's a negative, but immaterial result. In the last three examples on the right, so in D, E, and F, um, in these cases, these also are inconclusive results. So this is where the HDI crosses zero, it's within the rope. And in this case, we would conclude that there's no evidence to show that either that the treatment is better than the control. Um, yeah, so the A-B testing process, um, I'm going to break this into four different um, parts. So the first part is the planning. Um, this is done prior to the test going live. We then have the setup, which is once the configuration is decided. We then have the monitoring, which is done while the test is live. And then the analysis, which is done once all the planned um, a lot of time has, has elapsed. So the first one, planning. Um, so this is where we sort of determine the, the required configuration, set the target metrics, sample size estimation, how long we want to run the test. Um, so to go into that in a bit more detail. So firstly, do we need an A-B test? Um, and so if we want to properly assess incremental impact, then an A-B test is very useful. Um, and this is the purpose of the control group. So we're able to find out what would have happened if we didn't have this treatment. Um, the other option is then observational studies. Um, these give you less concrete results. Um, sometimes they need to be used in the cases where an A-B test can't. Um, however, they're easy to introduce selection bias. And it's also hard to account for any nuisance factors um, that you would naturally be taking into account with the randomization, with the A-B testing. So yeah, the next question is, what is the treatment? What exactly are we looking at? What are we trying to answer? Um, what, what do we want this A-B test for? And then we need to know what metrics we want to affect. Um, and these should be um, specified before we run the test, um, just to avoid any biased interpretation of the results. And then how, how much do we think these metrics will be affected? It's always good to set a target about um, what we're expecting to see so that we can evaluate the success of the test. And then who is our audience? Are we wanting to roll this out to the whole population? Are there specific groups that we're trying to target? And who should the, or how should the population be split? Um, ideally, a 50-50% split is great because of sample size. Um, but if we have something that might be quite risky, uh, we might be a bit risk adverse, we don't want to necessarily cause any damage, so we might want to actually test this on a much smaller group of players. Um, some technical considerations include how long we should run the test for. Um, so this is the sample size. Um, do we have a representative sample of our population? Uh, how long does the treatment cycle actually need to run to see its true effect? Um, and within Product Matters, we normally try and simulate this beforehand. Um, just to get a better idea of this. And the other thing is the overlap with other tests. Um, so any interaction between tests could invalidate the results. Um, and generally, two tests that will affect the same population in the same way or similar way shouldn't be run together, or else we need to uh, use batching. And then, yeah, essentially, is the A-B test worth it? So we need to consider the setup costs. How, how much is it going to cost to set up? How much is it going to cost to run? the likelihood that we're actually going to find um, any uplift, the risk that there's going to be a negative impact, how long do we, that we're going to have to run the test, and then also A-B testing bandwidth. Um, we always have a lot of A-B tests, so you know, we want to prioritize the ones that we're going to run. And then if we can do it in an observational study or whether we actually need this A-B testing. So the next part is the setup. Um, so once the configuration is decided, we can then begin the, ra uh, the random allocation of users. So in this case, it'll be quite different depending on, on uh, the company and sort of what technology you use. We have an admin tool where um, the product can um, configure the, the variants um, themselves. And then we have dynamic recruitment. So players are generally recruited into the study on their first um, activity after the A-B test starts. So here you can see in this example, we have a um, majority of our players entering um, the into the A-B test uh, when it starts. And these are going to be our existing, really engaged players. And then over time, we have uh, more players um, entering the test. And these are going to be maybe less 
um, engaged, maybe players that have taken a break. And then you have your new players that are entering the test throughout time. Um, monitoring, so while the test is live, um, it's always good to sort of keep track of what's going on and make sure that nothing's going wrong. So the first thing would be to check that the recruitment looks as expected. Um, so we want to make sure that um, the numbers look right, that the proportion of players going into each variant looks correct. Um, and then we can, check, uh, we can track any of the metrics over time. Um, and remember, not only the sample size is going to be increasing, but also the mix of players are going to change because you know, we're, we're having all of those less engaged players, new players are joining all the time. So in the graph here, in the light blue, you can see the percentage uplift over time. In the dark blue, we have the um, lower interval of the uplift. And in the red, we have the upper uh, limit of the interval. And you can see this changes over time. Um, and we have more players, more accurate results. But yeah, it's good to know that although it's, um, it is good to be tracking these metrics and tracking these, um, we don't want to avoid um, reporting selectively. The results do change, and yeah. Yeah, so the last stage would be the analysis. So once the plan, tips, uh, plan time has elapsed, uh, we then need to check, do we have a sufficient amount of data? And then we can access the results um, from a range of different perspectives, get a sort of overview of the situation. We can uh, yeah, analyze the results, interpret the results, make decisions. So yeah, as I said, we do dynamic recruitment. So this means that on a given date, players will have different durations within the test. So in this example, we have um, five days since the test started. So that's when we want to actually look at the analysis. But if we look at each of these lines represent one of the players, where the cross represents their recruitment date. So the players at the top, you can see, entered the study in the very beginning. Um, we have about five days worth of data for them. However, as you go down, you can see we have some players that entered the study at the very end. So potentially have one day or maybe less data. Um, and the way that we take that into account is that we standardize this by looking at X days following recruitment. And we call this metric windows. So in this example, again, we have five days. Um, we're doing the analysis on day five. But now we only look uh, at a two-day metric in this example. And we look at two days from the player's recruitment date. We can then exclude players that have incomplete windows. And then you can see those players in red. Um, so we use metric windows um, because they reduce uh, volatility with players recruited at different times. Um, and this leads to more accurate results. So players will now differ by their actual real characteristics rather than the period of time that they've been in the test as well, because um, it just uh, gives us additional noise. And we also avoid underweighting the new players um, if they've been entering the study sort of potentially at a later date. And we can also allow a, a, an isolation of short-term versus long-term effects. And what I mean by that is we have um, sort of one example is novelty or curiosity effect. So in this case, user engagement will initially rise because of some sort of temporary curiosity. It's new, it's exciting, people want to play it. Um, but long term, this impact um, might actually be lower than what we initially saw. So in this example, on day two, we see a 10% uplift, um, which is great. It would be quite exciting. Um, but if you look then from day six onwards, we see that this is, goes down to about 2%. On the opposite side, we have the learning effect. Um, so user engagement may not initially arise because players may need some time to familiarize themselves. They might need to sort of understand how it works or just get used to the feature. And the long-term effect impacts um, engagement um, is therefore higher than the initial uplift. So in this example here, you can see at two days, we have about a half percent uplift. However, after six days, this goes up to about two to three percent. So the way that we take that into account, um, we can do that in a couple of ways. So one way would be to look at the forward windows, and that's sort of what I've been discussing up until this point. Um, however, we can defer the start time. So if we look at the first example, again, we're looking at five days since the study started. We're looking at a two-day window. Um, and now, rather than using the recruitment date as the start time, we can defer that to a later date. Um, and then we can still take two days from there. And again, we, we um, remove players that have the incomplete metric window. The other option is to look at a backwards window. 
So in this case, we look at the day that we're analyzing the data, in this case, day five, and we look at the most recent two days. Um, so we look backwards. Um, and in the, these examples, you can see both of them were trying to sort of remove that initial um, short-term effect and so that we can get an idea of the, the true long-term effect. Yeah, so just to uh, give you an example of how the results um, of this look. Um, so here we have an example of four different um, metrics. So we have sessions, spins, coins bet per spin, and coins bet. And each of these lines represent um, the metric value smoothed over time. So in blue, we have the control, and in red, we have the treatment. And in the shaded um, area, this indicates the test period. So we would ideally like to see that these two lines are very similar before the test starts, um, and we can then assess how they differ during this test period. So you can see for sessions, it looks like there's not really much difference between the two. Um, slightly more for spins, um, and if you look at coins bet, it looks like there, there's a, you know, a, a good effect there. If we look at the A-B test results, here yeah, this sort of confirms what we see there, and now we see the, the blue line, the blue shaded area shows you the rope, again the bottom shows you the percentage uplift, the y-axis then shows you the probability of this uplift. Um, and yeah, this, this, if we look at sessions, then you can see that um, it's all within the rope. So yeah, negligible. It doesn't seem like there's any uplift there. Um, and if we look at the opposite and coins bet, um, we can see here that there is this positive uplift. Um, if we look at the seven-day window, so here we do have all the windows shown. So uh, the three-day, seven-day, 14-day, and 21-day. Um, and we look at the seven-day, we can then show that there's a 75 probability of an uplift being greater or equal to 6.5%. So just a few additional things. Um, so sometimes we only look, want to look at specific players. Um, and we can do this either at the very beginning in the recruitment stage, or we can do this as part of the analysis. So in the first case, we could just recruit only certain types of players that we want to look at. Um, however, if we want to recruit all of the players, we can do this retrospectively by splitting the players um, based on their pretest data. And the groups that we'd be considering are sort of different segments, different tenures. Uh, we could look at new players versus existing players, VIPs versus non-VIPs, payers versus non-payers. Um, just to note that removing VIPs can help with reducing volatility of the results, but the results don't give you the full picture. So when you are removing data, you, you do want to make sure that you consider this. And so for some metrics, just a few outliers canceling the results. Um, and then some other things, um, we can sort of adjust the metrics. Um, so it might be important to consider when we're looking at volatile metrics um, or small sample sizes. So up until now, I've been talking about the adjusted standard metrics. So this is where we take the data as it is. Uh, we assume that the A-B testing variants are all balanced so that the random allocation worked. Um, but this isn't always the case. Um, so sometimes we do still see some pretest biases, and in which case we can use an adjusted metric. So based on the historic data, we can then adjust for these pretest differences. Uh, it's less relevant for long-running tests, um, and we can only do this for existing players. And it might do more harm than good when we're looking at um, small pretest differences. So it's something to consider, but also something to take caution. And then um, the stratified metrics, so variance reduction. So we can compare the differences between um, similar players based on their historic data, aggregate the results up, and this then reduces the uncertainty or variance and pretest differences. Yeah, so I'll just end with some recommendations. Um, I would say we would always recommend big changes. Um, small changes are drowned out by noise. They don't pay our salaries, and they are essentially deck chairs on the Titanic. Um, and we should avoid tests that are done on sample, so, uh, tiny sample sizes um, that are essentially fishing expeditions or where the counterfactual is not viable. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thanks, Susan. Um, got time for some questions. Um, I'll just repeat them because I'm handing the mic around. Thank you. Uh, so, my 
the main challenge that I have been presented when I do A-B testing is companies normally say that they are data driven, but they are really not. <laughs> uh, and they say, oh, I want to do an A-B test, but they really have features to all their customers, and I don't have a sample. So sometimes I, I need to come up with an answer and I do an A-B test prior and post the treatment, right? Is this something that you can do with So you, do you mean sort of without actually having control and treatment? So more of like an observational study? Yeah. Um, sorry. So just, just to summarize the question, two questions. Uh, one, companies aren't actually data-driven. How do you cope with that? And two, um, how do you uh, stratify your, your test better? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say our company is very data-driven. And I think they do. I mean, uh, as data science, we're involved from the design stage, the um, implementation, the um, analysis, interpretation, and decision making. Um, so I think they, they take into account what we say, um, and I hope they appreciate it. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, and the other part I think you were asking more is, um, so rather than doing an A-B test, more of an observational study. So you potentially have um, some time where there's no treatment, you have the treatment, and then you want to see the effect. Um, so we do have cases like that. So for example, if we have a sale, um, and it's not necessarily possible to do an A-B test, um, and then we might look at some sort of seasonality models. Um, so actually my colleague in the back, is, um, you might want to talk to him about this. Um, so you could look at sort of predicting um, what you would expect would happen um, if we carried on, uh, see what actually happened, and then get an idea of the difference. Um, yeah. yeah. I think we had another question down here. Yeah, I have, um, I have actually a similar, similar problem. Um, so basically, we need to look into um, some of the IDs, um, which is obviously a very small population. So, so there is that um, sort of like ongoing conversation. Should we do a control test, or should we do a sort of like before after test? It's kind of like it's hard to determine sort of like what to do. Okay, so that's uh, dealing with dealing with small subsets of your population with different characteristics. Yeah, I mean, small small sample sizes are definitely difficult to. Um, sure. And yeah, you would have to run it probably for a much longer period of time if you are going to run it. Um, so then I guess it comes down to is it worth running? Um, yeah, I mean, maybe we could have a conversation afterwards and see see. Um, Another question here. So this is kind of a continuation about small sample sizes. How do you determine a, size a sample size is too small to actually do any testing on? OK, what's the smallest sample size? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's never an easy question to answer. I mean, it's yeah, very dependent on um, what you're trying to answer, how volatile the metrics are. Um, I would say, yeah, one thing is, is quite good to, to check how your results change as you increase the sample size. And you would hope that sort of um, you would eventually get to a stage where your results aren't changing too much and you have a pretty good estimation of your sample, of your population. Just to sort of follow up on that, in traditional testing, you might look at defining the power and the size of the effect in advance and then sort of rising the sample size. Yeah, so we do, we do try and do simulations beforehand where we, we use real data to sort of estimate um, the uplift that we're looking for, um, how, how big the sample size needs to be and how long we need to run it to do that. So we do try and do that before we actually run the test. Okay, best practice value for power of a test. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not sure. I think that's um, up for debate. <laughs> One more. Oh, two more. Did you experiment with any particular methodologies for observational studies? So, for instance, like matching collectiveness defenses or synthetic control. And if you did, how effective they were? Okay, so different methodologies for observational studies. Uh, we have looked at a bit. We've looked at propensity score matching. We've looked at um, the seasonality models. Um, I don't know offhand sort of the um, the comparison. I think this is sort of for us still work in progress and stuff that we're still looking at. Um, yeah, but obviously A/B testing does still have um, quite a lot of advantages over the other tests, um, which yeah you won't get from an observational study.
Yes, so how do you come to the scale and what do you do when you don't have uh, enough resources to take it that Okay, testing at scale and how do you cope with a lack of resource? Um, do you mean sort of sample size or sort of... Um, uh, more on the amount of tests that, or, or amount of changes that you want to test. Yeah, so within one test, obviously, you only want to make one small change um, to compare sort of the treatment control. We can do that by adding sort of different variants so we can have sort of slight changes, um, in which case we can run sort of... We can test a few things within one test. Um, when talking about... Yeah, I mean, we always have a backlog of, of A-B tests we want to, to look at. Um, in which case you just have to prioritize it and see which ones are going to be, um, w which ones will have the highest impact. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question though. Yeah, and how, how do you assess like, on a priority um, which one could have most uh, biggest impact? Yeah, so that's um, sort of, I guess, exploratory analysis. It's sort of trying to get an idea of how m much we think um, the test could give us. Um, and also that also comes a lot from product, the product teams that are designing it, so sort of what they expect it to be. Um, also just depends on, on the metric. So if you're wanting a 1% uh, uplift on one metric, it might be a lot harder than a 1% uplift on another. Um, so there's quite a few things that we consider with that. So choosing the metric window um, to cope with novelty effects, is that a prior decision or is that something you look at with the data? Uh, so that's something that we look at when we analyze the data. Um, so we also have an understanding, or we hope we have an understanding of the feature and what to expect, um, but we would take that into account during the analysis phase. Um, and then we can look at sort of how that, how that looks and then decide how to deal with it. Um, potentially, um, but I think, yeah, the, the power analysis for us is uh, sort of just to get an idea of, of um, the sample size and the time to run. So it, it might, but um, yeah, something we should consider. Okay, this is about the long, ongoing war between frequentists and Bayesians. Uh, that is a good question. Um, since I started, it's always been Bayesian. Um, I would have to refer you to, to Michael at the back there um, if you want to have a better idea. <laughs> I think we have another question down here somewhere. Yep. What's it, uh, what factors do you take into account when figure out how long to run the test? How to choose how long you run the test. Um, yeah, so that uh, we would think about sort of, I guess you have to think about the population, so um, who we included, um, the potential sample size that we could get, um, and then very much dependent on the metrics. So we have some metrics that are very volatile, some that aren't, and all of these we would, we would consider. Um, yeah, I mean, but there's also other things, I guess, to consider from a business side of, of it, um, sort of how long we can practically run it, um, how long it's. Yeah, um, the cost and all of those sort of things as well. Great. Um, let's all thank Susan again for a really interesting talk.